very happy to have on this show someone I talk about and invoke all the time, praising. It's our friend Joy Reid, award-winning journalist, host of The Readout, airs, of course, weeknights on MSNBC from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, also author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Medgar and Marley, Medgar Evers and the Love Story That Awakened America, which we covered on Salon and played that interview here on this show. Joy, great to see you. It is so good to be with you, Dean. How you doing? I'm doing good. You know, we got a week to the election and there's the recounts and then the Civil War. So it's going to be a busy fall. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, it will. Know, so from that, will take us to the holidays. And then from there, oh, my God. So let's talk about what happened yesterday, because I saw you posting about it. The Trump rally at MSG, which was really uh, very on the nose for 1939. And you highlighted something that I didn't see. And then I went back and listened that just the first thing I got to flag is Byron Donald's the only black Republican member of Congress who spoke, they played the song Dixie before he came on stage. They could play any song, That's but they right. played Dixie. What's your reaction to that? I, so, I, and, and I didn't believe it when I saw right. on, you know, you know, I don't post anymore on X Twitter because I just refuse to do business uh, with somebody who has a, um, a, a sort of um, nostalgia for white South Africa <laughs> for the white South right. African in an apartheid era. Um, but I still look at it, you know, I'll just scroll through and see what's on it. And somebody posted that that happened. I was like, I can't believe that's true. So I said, let me just do a little Google and make and damned if it didn't happen. Literally, Byron Donald's black Republican from Florida, from mm -hmm. a part of the former Confederacy, is about to come on stage and they played Dixie Elvis Presley singing. I wish I was in the land of cotton right before he comes up. And then as he walks out. They start playing a John Cena rap song, like a WWE, you know, former WWE uh, star John Cena's hip hop song as his actual walk on song. But before that, they played Dixie for that black man to walk out and he still walked out there. Like, where's the personal it's part of the trade? Dignity? It's right. And so and we, you and I talk about autocracy a lot. I think you're maybe a lot of yeah. our texts about autocracy. Part of what autocrats do is they humiliate their supporters, they humiliate their sycophants. And Byron Donald has been humiliated over and over again. Um, that white Republican from Texas who's pro-lynching rubbing his head or some white Republican rubbing his head uh, like he's a child, um, then putting him up supposedly to be Speaker of the House. And then that same white Republican from Texas admitting they only did it because he's black and they wanted to have a black man to counter Democrats nominating a black potential speaker he just he takes that humiliation and comes back for more yeah and on some level i mean to me it conjures up james baldwin's famous t writing about how you get your white card for minorities like italian and irish weren't white when they came here they were italian and they were irish and they were german but to get your white card you had to make a trade and in this case it was joined in the oppression of black people in america in this the trade is give up your self-worth and your self-dignity as a person and then we'll give you the maga card which is like a white card i mean let's be blunt that's what this is so and overall last night i mean i have to be honest i was looking at the headlines today they really the corporate media actually did a good job they are covering Trump's rally and headline after headline are about the racism and sexism and bigotry. But what I get a sense, there's almost a surprise. I'm like, have you not, <laughs> did you not get this? This is what fuels MAGA. I didn't need that rally to show me MAGA as a hate group. And that's what they respond to. And their defense today is all, jo it was all jokes. Right. No, I'm a comedian. They weren't jokes. Yeah. Rudy and Giuliani also wasn't joking. No, Rudy Gelana wasn't joking. And the the podcaster, I'm going to forget his name, John, whatever his name is, the guy who uh, Tony, came from. Tony Hincliffe. Tony Hincliffe. So yeah. so they're trying to write him off as though for, the first defense was these are just jokes. Why don't you all on the left have a sense of humor? So first right. of all, even in the room, barely anyone was laughing. So if they were jokes, they were they were jokes that were ineffective, even in front of a mega crowd. So that's number one. Number two you and I both know, and I know from having worked on political campaigns and in the campaign world, that you don't just show up and speak off the top of your head at a major campaign event. You submit your remarks in advance and they load your remarks into the prompter. So they knew what he was going to say. And number three, they know who he is. Part of his history as a comedian is that he does racist jokes. He did a racist joke about an Asian American comedian who introduced him at an event. He literally does race jokes for a living. 
And he has a podcast that one could listen to to know what he was going to do. So they knew who they hired. They knew what he was going to say. He got up there giving a line that then the defense after it was just jokes. You have no sense of humor. I, I promise you, I went on social media to look at the response from MAGA people. They were like, well, why do you think Puerto Ricans come to the mainland? Puerto Rico is a pile of garbage. So their defense is to be racist against Puerto Ricans, to defend the, the guy who's racist against Puerto Ricans. And it's it's not open mic night at Madison Square Garden, right? right? So like, hey, if you like Trump, you can just come on the stage in front of 15, 20,000 people and, say, and just wing it. It's not open mic night. No. I would have went if it was open mic night. It wouldn't have went well, but I would have went. But then some of the other comments, like Tucker Carlson calling Vice President Harris low IQ and so did Donald Trump low IQ. And Grant Cardone, a big businessman saying that she has pimp handlers. There was no comedy. This was straight up racism, sexism, misogyny. Rudy Giuliani saying Palestinians are taught to kill Americans at two years old. There, no cop. There wasn't a, like the rum pump at the end of the line. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like I was kidding, folks. There's a duck going whack quack. No, it was just it was pure straight up. It's racism, bigotry, and sexism. But I don't think it's controversial to say that is the fuel of MAGA. I'm not saying everybody voting for Trump. I was on board with that, but I'm saying for the hardcore maggot, that, that is, he slid it down the escalator in 2016, 2015, technically, to kick off the campaign demonizing Mexicans. His closing argument is also racism and bigotry. It hasn't changed. He's the same guy. He's the, he's the same guy. And, and not only that, I mean, he, it's also deeply ironic, right? Everything they do is so ironic. You've got Dr. Phil getting up there so, and complaining about DEI. When the only reason anyone knows who Dr. Phil is, is because he was the DEI hire of Oprah Winfrey. But for that black billionaire, no one would know who Dr. Phil is. I'm not even sure if he's really a doctor. I'm not sure whether he, what is his educational background? I don't know. People just trust his advice because Oprah said that they should. He, do, he, he didn't exist other than that, right? At Dr. Oz, same thing. No one would have known who Dr. Oz is. So the reality is, is these people were put on the national stage because they were her DEI hires, <laughs> because she wanted to make sure that as a black woman, she included a couple white guys. <laughs> so, you know, it's all like Donald Trump would not be known by Americans had he not been the only broke, fake billionaire who needed a job so badly that Mark Burnett could get him to be on The Apprentice. They did ask other rich men and rich, oh. successful billionaire types in um, New York. But much like the housewives, real rich housewives don't have time to be on the housewives. Those right. are people who need a job. And in the case of The Apprentice, he's the one who took the job because he was flat broke and he was a failure. And therefore, he needed a job. And I'm not just the housewives, y'all. Don't come for me, please. When you hear this, the housewives are awesome. We love them. But they're but they're playing a role, right? They're playing, right. and they do a great job playing a role, and everyone loves right. them because they're interesting. But when they go through, like, a billionaire's housewife ain't doing that because she ain't got time to do that. And Trump did, the billionaire house guy that he did. I'm talking to our friend Joy Reid. So, Joy, B Vice President Harris, well, it was a great contrast. Her big rally, 30,000 people, in Houston, Beyonce was there. And what I liked about it was that it was a mix of a dam dance party, but also very somber message, very powerful message. Yeah. It's focused on one issue as opposed to Trump things, which he went on Joe Rogan and it's everything in the world from he wants to be a whale psychiatrist, which he actually said, I'm not even kidding, but that was about reproductive freedom. And they had doctors come on stage and share heartbreaking stories. And Beyonce talked about, I'm not here as a politician or celebrity. I'm here as a mother. I think that was so powerful. So how important do you think that is? And leaning into this, perhaps as really the closing message is reproductive freedom. I think it's huge because if you look at the target smart data for who's coming out and voting, there's a massive gender gap. Women mm -hmm. are coming out to vote in much higher numbers than men. You know, it's like 55, 45 in some of these states. And so what you're seeing is, look, you have to remember, this is the first presidential election after Roe v. Wade uh, fell, after Dobbs. And so we saw the first midterm election after Dobbs in 2022. It was a tsunami of women coming out and washing over this supposed red wave. There was this 
belief in the media among those who just follow the polling averages and who obsess over the polling averages, that that was going to be an inflation and crime election. But I could see, and just I knew anecdotally and was very confident in the way that 2022 would turn out, because all you really heard anecdotally out in the world was how angry women were about losing their bodily autonomy. And I'm not just talking about liberal women, progressive women, I'm talking mm -hmm. about Republican women, conservative yeah. women, women who typically vote the other way. And so whenever there was an, uh, an agenda item put up or an amendment, a constitutional amendment put up to protect um, abortion rights, it passed in Kansas, in Ohio. It doesn't matter if it's a red state or a blue state. It passed because women want their rights back. And so we haven't seen the full um, sort of outgrowth of that anger. Women have not finished letting off steam about losing their abortion rights because it's not just about abortion, as was discussed by Beyonce. Mm -hmm. and Miss Tina and all the other folks who uh, came out in Texas, it's about whether or not you own yourself. And that's a fundamental question of freedom and liberty. And so that message has resonated across the aisle. And so you're seeing women come out in huge numbers. And you cannot tell me that they're coming rushing out to vote for Donald Trump. I don't believe it. No. And, you know, that gender gap, you know, it's I, I wrote about it in Substack and, and I pitched it to MS, but they weren't interested for whatever reason. But that when you look at poll turnout, since 1980, women have been a bigger percentage of the electorate. And in 2020, young women versus young men, which is Trump is lying on, young women came out 11 percent higher and women came out 10 percent higher. And that's kind of typical. So what we're seeing, and I think when you break it down, you're going to see young women coming out in big numbers because young men are the easiest, the least reliable, most distractible. Harris should just send out, Vice President Harris should send out to all Rogan Listeners like free pizza and weed on election day so that they don't go out. They're like, was that election day? I missed it, huh? Well, right. what can you do? For women, it's not political. It's personal. It's your life. You're being forced against your will to carry a fetus a term and you might die because of it. This yeah. is barbarism on parade in America. And though on the right, I don't know if they care or don't get it or they actually are down with forcing women against their will to carry a fetus a term. That's I mean, they they are. I mean, they are the Taliban. They are the American equivalent, the Christian equivalent of the Taliban. Right. They don't yep. believe that women should have equal access to education, which is why they're against DEI and affirmative action, which, again, mostly benefits white women. They're in favor. They're not in favor of women being in the C-suites or rising to high levels in corporate America. They want them to go home like Usha Vance, who is a, a, a double Yale educated lawyer who used to clerk for two different Supreme Court justices. Um, but now she has talked about as if she is the nanny when J.D. Vance speaks about her. And her mom, who is also an accomplished, I believe, scientist, is also spoken about as if she is the Indian nanny. They want women to be subordinate the same way the Taliban does. They want there to be a thing called coverture again, where women exist under the authority of their fathers and then their husbands or their brothers if they don't have a husband. They don't believe women should have the right to vote. Some of them are openly saying that. Mm -hmm. They believe that women should exist under the authority of men. And they believe in forced birth. We've now seen more than 60,000 infants born of rape in this country since the fall of Roe v. Wade. And this is the predictable outcome of getting rid of abortion rights. The number of abortions has not gone down. It's gone up. The only difference is more women are dying in the course of getting uh, reproductive care. More babies are being born who are unwanted because they are born from rape and incest. We've just seen skyrocketing uh, in disease and near death among women yep. and actual deaths among women. Our fetal mortality rate and our maternal mortality rate have gone way up. And for black women, it's up in the double digits. And so all they're doing is killing women, making women sicker, making women more afraid, making women have to leave their state and flee their state. And by the way, Dean, as you and I both know, in Project 2025, they want to be able to track women like the Fugitive Slave Act allowed people to do. They want to be able to track women's movements if they leave an abortion state to go to a free state. So we're now back to the slavery era when it comes to women's reproductive freedom. Yeah. And it's interesting you said it because I've made the analogy on my show where Lincoln said, a nation can't stand half free, half slave. I think the same thing applies here when you're dealing with abortion. It yes. can't stand half free, half religious fascism, religious. We supremacy. become one or the other. We're going to yeah. become one or the other. We're either going to be Texas and Florida and Louisiana and Mississippi all over the nation, or we're going to be free states all over the nation. And women, we're going to have to ha flee over state lines for freedom with the analogy continuing through slavery and that the Fugitive Slave Act allow. I mean, you had some states that wanted to 
they want to penalize people for bringing someone over state lines. Like they're yeah. literally going back and mining what was going on <laughs> in the time of slavery to go like, oh, how could we do this here? And and then we're the bad people for using terms like slavery or fascism, stuff like that. And I'm telling you, know. Joy Reid, a couple more things. What's your reaction? You know, well, LA Times got slightly complicated the reason they didn't endorse if that's true now because the daughter came up but washington post no complication washington post jeff bezos made a business decision now for amazon not getting involved in politics i'm fine with that but the washington post is a storied publication that should and to say we're not going to endorse and it was clearly for business reasons there's that part of it is also the fear factor where donald trump is saying i'm going to take cbs's license away who as president want the FCC to investigate Senator at live. Like they know if he comes back in. He, so on some level, it's a business thing. And the other part is that more of this, this fear of, of a fascist leader who's going to use the apparatus of government to silence critics. Yeah. And also not only who's telegraphing it, but will be surrounded by Looney Tunes people like none of the normal normies will be there. There won't be any General Milley, General Kelly, who's a right winger, but he's at least a normal person. Right. Um, they're, they're, He won't be surrounded by even Jeff Sessions, you know, who, who was only it was only so far he was willing to go in terms of committing crimes in office. He won't be surrounded by right wingers like Mike Pence, who's a far right wing religious zealot, but who wasn't willing to break the law and break federal law for Trump. Now, all the people who will be in there, the the craziest of the crazy, because now he knows that the quote unquote deep state just means normal people who are not willing to break the law for him. And now that John Roberts, chief justice of the Supreme Court, has said that he's able to break the law, that he has full immunity, that if he wants to break the law, he can. He's just going to bring in people who are willing to do whatever and do all the things. And so people who say, and this is the, you probably hear this on the radio when your callers call in who are conservatives or who are MAGA, they say, oh yeah, if he's going to do it, why didn't he do it when he was in for four years? He didn't do it then. Yeah, he didn't do it then. He tried to do it, but you had people like, um, Mike Esper, who was like, you can't shoot people in the street. You had Mark Milley saying, you can't shoot protesters in the street, sir. That is not a thing you can do. No, you can't do it. And so he had people stopping him, but he wanted to do it. It's just that he was stopped even by people like Bill Barr, who was willing to jail Michael Cohen, but he mm -hmm. wasn't willing to jail Hillary Clinton. But if Trump right. could have jailed Hillary Clinton, he would have. He asked if he could do these things, but he was told no. Now there'll be no one telling him no. That's the difference. And not only that, the Supreme Court in the Trump versus U.S. decision made it clear expressly in that opinion, the president has absolute immunity in discussions yep. with DOJ about who to prosecute. I'm like, Correct. why would you put that in writing? I'm like, what is wrong with you? And Roberts put that in writing there. And I'm like, to me, the light bulb went off and I read that. I'm like, you... You don't treasure this. Like you want a president to be a king. And that's yes. that's part of it. I'm trying to read last two things. One is, you know, you mentioned oligarchy. You have Elon Musk now who is going to make policy if he if Trump wins and he's just buying his way. We're going we're in a new Gilded Age where the robber barons are going to run everything. I'm reading a really good book about the Gilded Age right now and the railroad magnets then you know, with Vanderbilt and others. Now it's the Musk, it's the magnets from big tech. But what are your concerns about if Trump were to win, that he's truly transactional, even in his bigotry, he's transactional. Now he yeah. likes Muslims because he needs in Michigan. <laughs> and because Saudi gave two billion to Jared, right? He's like, right. oh, I, Muslims ban them. Two billion? I love these people. That's, <laughs> so, that's exactly. But now he's transactional in everything. This will be a government for sale, like like President Sherman, like kind of scandals, like just crazy scandals. And mm. I wonder if anyone will hold him accountable. Right. And I mean, this is the full emergence of the U.S. into oligarchy, which is, let's be honest, how we started out. It was a bunch of rich right. guys like the Jeffersons of the world who and the Madisons who owned, you know, thousands of slaves and were basically operating plantations that were forced to pay taxes to the king of England. The royal family in England operated plantations all across the Caribbean. We started out as an oligarchy. We had a brief period where we emerged out of it during Reconstruction. And then we had, you know, after the Gilded Age, the, you know, Teddy Roosevelt moment yeah. and then on through the 20th century we sort of sort of started to pull away from being an oligarchy and a more and having a, a real middle class and having you know people who are able to to thrive in the middle but they don't believe in that people like Elon Musk and Peter Thiel they came from apartheid South Africa 
and they left apartheid South Africa as young men or teenagers, but they seem to miss that old fascist system where you had a small group of white elites and then you had a vast majority of black workers who had no appreciable rights, no right to vote and no rights that white men needed to respect. They are trying to recreate that system here. And then you have people like Jeff Bezos and all these other billionaires who don't care about democracy. What they care about is money. You know, we're on the brink of having a, our first trillionaire who will probably be Elon Musk. And all they care about is accumulation of wealth. And democracy is inconvenient to that plan. So what they're looking to do is to own a president and a vice president. Peter Thiel already owns J.D. Vance. He's basically yeah. his house pet, you know. And so they're thinking not, and John Roberts and these other monarchists, they're not thinking about democracy. They're thinking about making sure that we have an oligarchic sort of monarchical system in which the people they believe are superior rule the rest of us and everyone else has to live under their authority. And they honestly think that's a better form of government. I think they're sincere about believing that that is better. And they are trying to build an oligarchic sort of monarchy here. And they don't care if it's Trump at the top of it or J.D. Vance. I actually think they'd prefer J.D. Vance because they control yeah. him, too. But he could serve longer because he's younger. And so and he's also in completely in controllable. He knows nothing. He has no government experience. So, of course, they'd be in charge of him, too. So, I mean, the prospect of Elon Musk and Peter Thiel running this government if that's not scary enough for you, I, I don't know what to tell you. But that's really what would happen if Trump came in because his brain is mashed potatoes. It is. And again, I say I wrote an article about this because for Substack, I just everything I write, I don't have to pitch. I just so I wrote about he'll be a Pino, a president name only, where yeah. as his brain develops, they're never going to use the 25th Amendment. That is a spectacle. You don't do that. You have the Project 2025 people. They give him a cheeseburger. They give him a Diet Coke, a yeah. Coke, you know, and just Set sign this. Yeah. Sign this and he gets to give a speech. And if people think that can't happen, you know, when you look back at Reagan the last year or two, you know, his son and Leslie Stahl said that the Alzheimer's was there. They saw it and some of his staff said, well, maybe there was something, but they were not going to use the 25th Amendment. You just control him. Let him yeah. have his fun at the moments where he's lucid and other times you hide him. That's what they'll do. We'll have a puppet president in Donald Trump. Last thing, what are your concerns? Like in a week and a day, we have the election. We're going to get the results. It could go either way. But let's assume good happens and Vice President Harris prevails and Donald Trump show finally sort of gets canceled. What are your concerns in post-election? We know they're going to litigate, which they're allowed to. That's fine. It's the January 6th part. But are you concerned that this could lead down the path of some kind of political violence like a January 6th again? A hundred percent. And I think the, the the rally last night to return to the rally that produced the Bad Bunny endorsement that the Kamala Harris team wanted the whole time. I mean, right. Bad Bunny endorsing is actually a big political story because he's got like 45 million followers and a huge following and Ariana Grande and all of the other people who've now come out for her. So that, I think, helps the Harris campaign. And remember, Harris is the only one who's building a, a larger base and growing her base. She's right. now got Republicans, AOC, the Cheneys. You know, it's a huge base. So the 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 high likelihood is Kamala Harris wins the popular vote, right? And most Democrats, are they're, they're built to win the popular vote because they have a broader coalition that, again, now includes Cheney-style Republicans. So I can tell you, I'll predict one thing that's going to happen on election night is that Donald Trump will declare victory at about 9 o'clock. He'll say, I won the election, regardless of what the numbers say. And the reason that he's doing hate rallies like the ones we saw at MSG in a state he's not going to win, and the reason people like Marjorie Taylor Greene are going on uh, X Twitter and saying they're going to win California, is there? and the reason that all these Trafalgar and all these other right-wing pollsters are dropping these pro-Trump polls and pushing the polling averages to the right, is they want to create a condition in which they can say, even MSNBC said we were going to win. Everybody knew we were going to win. All the polls that we we're going to win, even though they don't. We were winning this election in a landslide. We were poised to win New York and California, and they cheated. And to have his base so angry and so certain of victory that when he doesn't win, they lose it. Because he has only one way of being able to become president again. It has to either go through, well, the courts. And the courts are his one sort of backstop because he can't win the popular vote. It's just not going to happen. He's just not popular enough. And so what they're hoping happens is either it's so close that they can litigate the election back to John Roberts because they know John Roberts will deliver the election. He's just a leader without the wife with flags. So they will literally give him the election or have it be close enough to deliver it to the House of Representatives 
and to have this house still be in the hands of Mike Johnson. And then they do a state by state vote and he becomes president. So that's two ways to get back in. Or the third way is you just do another January 6th and just have straight up outright political violence and to try to force the election into chaos to where people aren't really sure who's the uh, who, who is the winner. That is the Maduro style of becoming president. That is literally what Maduro did in Venezuela. He lost the election. Every sort of outside expert that looks at that election says he lost, but it doesn't matter because he strong armed his way back into leadership of that country. And now they cannot escape him. Trump is hoping he can pull a Maduro. And if he can't pull a Maduro, he'll take an Argentina where the incels you know, rush him back in and angry young men put him back in. But it's highly unlikely that there are enough angry young, you know, mainly white, but some black and brown fascists to get him in office. So he's going to go for one of those other options. Well, we got a, a week and a, and a day to to see how this plays out. I it's a deep it's 1860 for America. And I don't know if people yeah. realize that. I don't mean a civil war is coming. I mean a fragmenting of the United States. I really don't see a civil war. I can see pockets of violence, but more and more of the fragmenting where we're no longer red states, blue states. We're red nations, blue nations going forward. And maybe we don't all pay our taxes anymore to a federal government <laughs> when we don't agree with them politically. Like, I, I just see this just fracturing. But, Joy, thanks so much for being on. Listen, Watch Joy's show. Even though it's on the same time as mine, you could record her show <laughs> or listen to my show on demand because I'm on 6 to 9 and you're in the middle there at 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern yes. time. Uh, the readout. It's such a pleasure and a treat to chat with you and I always love being on your show my friend thanks very much have a great day thank you Dean it's always a pleasure my friend and Godspeed to all of us <laughs> yes